All right, so most of us know about probiotics. Those are, quote, the friendly bacteria that inhabit our gut. And most of us know about probiotics because we've been told ad nauseum that we need to eat yogurt because it's loaded with probiotics. We need to take probiotic capsules and we need to look at how many billion counts of these probiotics are there and maybe you know a hundred billion is more important than four billion and we may even need to look at the types of these probiotics. So these are great but what most of us don't realize is the vast majority of probiotics never make it into your intestines and the vast majority of probiotics that you swallow are not part of our normal gut flora but instead they basically go on vacation in your gut for a few weeks and then they leave they don't become a part of your permanent flora so if they aren't that important what next? Well, what's next is prebiotics. So prebiotics are the food that your gut buddies eat, that your, if you will, your probiotics need to eat and grow. Uh, I like to explain prebiotics to my patients who uh, live in Palm Springs as, let's suppose I sell you some grass seed out in the desert and you come back uh, a month later and say you sold me bad grass seed because it didn't grow and I go well did you water it and they said well no you didn't tell me to and I go well did you give it any fertilizer did you give it any mulch and they go well no you didn't tell me to well I said well of course it's not going to grow because it has to have nourishment and it has to have water and yet we make the mistake thinking that our gut buddies uh, don't need water and nourishment to grow. And that's in fact what prebiotics do. Prebiotics in general are fibers that we can't digest. They're indigestible by our enzyme systems. We can't break them down. And so they arrive as long chain sugar molecules that our gut buddies primarily in our large intestine think is the best thing since excuse the expression sliced bread it'll be lectin free sliced bread but lectin <laughs> sliced bread anyhow and this is what they want to eat now that's great we now feed our gut buddies what they want to eat they multiply and they do all sorts of wonderful things well, for years we, know, we knew that our gut buddies were incredibly useful for us. We knew that they liked prebiotic fiber to eat. We knew that the more prebiotic fiber we gave them, the more of them they would make, and quite frankly, the bigger our bowel movements would be. But what we didn't know was that these guys were making compounds that are now called postbiotics and these are actually why you want probiotics you want prebiotics to feed the probiotics because it's the postbiotics that these guys make and manufacture that make all the difference in your health and Part of my new book, The Energy Paradox, is introducing everybody to postbiotics. One way to think about postbiotics is basically the, the bowel movements of the bacteria themselves, the bacterial farts, if you like. So these are what comes out of the bacteria fermenting the prebiotic fiber that you give them. And the entire science of postbiotics is dramatically new. 
Let me, uh, let me take you back uh, a number of years. Uh, as many of you know, I make it a point of attending and presenting talks at uh, multiple uh, probiotic, prebiotic seminars around the world, microbiome sem seminars. One of my favorites is the World Congress of Microbiota, which is put on usually every year in Paris. Obviously, last year it was a virtual event. But uh, one of the chairmen of that program um, is a professor from Paris by the name of Marvin Edes. And years ago, he and I were talking after one of my presentations, and he says, you know that probiotics, the microbiome, actually talks to mitochondria, talks to the brain, talks to our DNA. And I said, well, yes, I accept that, but why haven't we discovered the language that this communication is occurring? I said, why can't we find the text messages that this occurs? And he said, well, we know it exists. He says, it'll just be a matter of time before that language is deciphered. And lucky for all of us that that language has been deciphered. In fact, a few years ago, it won the Nobel Prize for Medicine with the discovery of how nitric oxide actually works. We now know that there are a host of what are called short-chain uh, fatty acids and postbiotic gasomessengers or gasotransmitters that is the language in which the microbiome talks to our mitochondria, talks to our DNA, talks to our brain. And who would have guessed that simple compounds that we produce as gas every day by our microbiome are so essential to actually tell our mitochondria to make energy, how much energy to make, to tell our brain what kind of mood we ought to be in. And it's all from this newly discovered language of postbiotics. So the important thing about that is, yeah, you got to have a great microbiome, probiotics but you got to feed the microbiome what they want to eat, which is prebiotics. They, in turn, will make postbiotics, which is actually why you need the other, the other two. Okay, so this is truly a language, and the breaking of this code uh, I describe in the Energy Paradox is really equivalent to the breaking of the Enigma Code in World War II. The Enigma Code was the German code where all German troop movements, all German plane movements uh, were directed by a code that was unbreakable. We could listen in and hear the code, but the code was so complex that years were spent trying to break the language of that code. And uh, there's even a famous movie about the Enigma Code. The point of all this is, the language exists, we just didn't know how to interpret the language. And that's what's so exciting about postbiotics. So, just to go really nerdy for a minute, most of you who have read my books know that mitochondria, which are the little energy-producing organelles in most of our cells, are actually ancient engulfed bacteria. About two billion years ago, bacteria were actually engulfed by another cell, and in exchange for living inside that cell and getting nutrients from that cell, the bacteria produced energy, ATP. And in that exchange, it became really the precursor for all living life forms on Earth, the eukaryotic cell. Now, why, why that's so exciting and why the microbiome is so exciting in its communication 
with these engulfed bacteria is we inherit our DNA to make mitochondria from our mothers. Our dad doesn't give us any mitochondrial DNA. And so mitochondria, because they're ancient bacteria, can actually grow and reproduce without the cell that they live in dividing because they have their own DNA. And the really cool thing is we get our initial microbiome from our mother by exiting her birth canal, her vagina, and she, as we joke, literally takes a crap on us and gives us our microbiome. So our mother gives us the ancient bacteria in all our cells, the mitochondria, and she gives us our own microbiome. And as we've talked about many, many times, the microbiome is sisters to the mitochondria. And now we know that these sisters talk to each other via postbiotics. So, if the, sis if the girls down in the microbiome are happy, they're well fed, they're given what they need to eat, they in turn pass this information on to our energy producing mitochondria that things are great down below, make some energy, take care of this organism that's taking care of them. And so everything is actually, in the end, interconnected to feeding our microbiome what they want. In turn, the microbiome then literally sends out text messages in the form of short-chain fatty acids like butyrate, like acetate, and sends out gases, literal gases, like hydrogen gas, um, the gas in the Hindenburg, by the way, like hydrogen sulfide, which is the rotten egg smell, like methane, like carbon dioxide, and like nitric oxide. And I can guarantee you that as time goes on, we'll find other gases that the microbiome is also producing that has an effect. Let me give you one of the most startling examples that I use in the energy paradox. The Japanese researchers looked at the microbiome of people with Parkinson's. And for a number of years, we've known that the microbiome of Parkinson's patients is very different than the microbiome of people who don't have Parkinson's. And there's a lot of evidence that Parkinson's begins in the gut, not in the brain. But in these, with these researchers, they looked at what sort of gases the microbiome of the Parkinson's patients were making versus normal. And they found that the Parkinson's patients did not have a microbiome that was producing hydrogen gas, whereas the normal people had a microbiome that was producing nitrogen gas, hydrogen gas, sorry. So they got the clever idea, well, what if we give the Parkinson's patients hydrogen water? And you can make hydrogen water, uh, it is literally hydrogen, molecular hydrogen dissolved in water, and they gave these patients hydrogen water to drink every day. And lo and behold, their Parkinson's symptoms got better. Why? Well, it turns out hydrogen is an essential component in how your mitochondria produce energy. Hydrogen contributes protons, which are essential to manufacturing, generating ATP. And so part of what we now realize our microbiome was actually doing was giving substrates to mitochondria to produce energy. And if they didn't provide those substrates, those mitochondria that affected the dopaminergic neurons died. And that's why these people developed Parkinson's disease. 
Interestingly, um, when I was writing The Longevity Paradox, you may remember I got really fascinated with the naked mole rat. And naked mole rats, just to bring you up to speed, are the longest living rats by far. Uh, most rats live about two years. N naked mole rats can live 20 to 30 years. And yet they're a rat. And they live in colonies in the Sub-Sahara Desert in Africa. And long story short, people figure, try and figure out, well, how the heck do these guys live so much longer? And one of the interesting things that became evident is that the naked mole rat produces a lot of hydrogen sulfide by eating underground tubers, eating underground roots, eating mushrooms. And the hydrogen sulfide gas can actually be used by mitochondria to produce energy, particularly if oxygen levels are low, which they are um, deep in these tunnels. So I got the crazy idea that humans are very long-lived as an animal, and I wonder if one of the reasons we're so long-lived is that we have a lot of hydrogen gas. So I decided to look at the literature to look at the amount of hydrogen sulfide gas in naked mole rats in their blood, and the amount of hydrogen sulfide in our blood, and lo and behold, humans and naked mole rats have the lowest hydrogen sulfide gas levels in blood of most any other animal. And I was crestfallen and went, oh man, so much for that theory. And then of course I slapped myself on the head and said, well of course we have extremely low levels because our mitochondria are using that gas as an energy substrate just like the naked mole rat is. And in fact, very good evidence shows that there is a sweet spot, what I call the Goldilocks rule, where hydrogen sulfide production by your microbiome, a postbiotic gas, is incredibly important for keeping your mitochondria healthy, healthy and active. If you found this video helpful, I think you're going to love this one. For many, many, many years, really up until recently, we had no idea that uh, this microbiome, number one, even existed, uh, and number two, was actually producing, uh, in your analogy, fruits and vegetables.